time of worship. It's okay to get excited, to dance around, to jump around. Um, we're going to have fun, and so let's get started. Thank you. 
My name is Dylan Chase. Make some noise if you were at camp this summer. Most of you. Make some noise if you were at the one and only hip hop show at the rodeo that happened a year ago. I still remember. That was amazing. So basically, I can't use any of the same jokes or illustrations on you guys. So this is going to be hard. No, I'm here with my girls. Y'all say what's up, Sammy and Malia. Hands in the air. Now, you don't know the other two in mind, but the other two. Yeah, so I'm here with the family, and we drove in today and just excited to, to dive into God's Word. You know, I do, I've been doing this a while, and a lot of you at camp know there's about to be a huge transition in our life, and things have even progressed since we've been at camp, and on March 1st, the day before Malia's birthday, we will be in Japan. Now, it'll be February 28th here, but it'll be March 1st in Japan for most of the day, so I realize I look back on what's been, you know, um, over a decade doing ministry, and now every time I come and do something like this, it's just so special because I think unless something else you know weird happens, I probably won't be in Children's Texas again for a while. And that's sad because y'all have a Starbucks now. You know, y'all didn't have that. I was like, I must have took a wrong turn. There's a Starbucks here, you know. So that's awesome. Y'all are coming up in the world. But seriously though, I'm trying to take moments like this 
and just use them for all they were, just cherish the moments traveling with my girls. It's something that's just been so part of our flow of life for, for so long as we get ready to do something else. And tonight is, uh, and really this whole weekend is a big, it's a big idea, it's a big topic. You know, the whole theme is to redefine, to redefine our existence and our purpose and our identity. And I just want to tell you guys this, because I know sometimes you think, well, what does it, you know, really matter? It's like, you know, we're going to have like three sessions, we're going to worship, we're going to do small group time. But I tell you, it's, it's the little right things that you do day in and day out at life that will get you to where you want to go. For instance, if, if you were going to, for some strange reason, just try to attempt to sail from, from Los Angeles to Hawaii, and you just got off a little bit. It was just three degrees. Three degrees off. That doesn't seem like a big number, right? So I was like, you know, what is the difference between, you know, 197? It's not that big of a deal. It's just three. It's just three. If you were, were to try to sail from Los Angeles to Hawaii off by just three small degrees, you would miss it by 150 miles. It's the small things where we have to stop and re-examine our life and say, Am I redefining my existence? Why am I here? Who put me here? Those are just real two basic questions that we sometimes have to remind ourselves of. You know, not only do we need to uh, think about this word redefine as a term of humility, because you might define it the wrong way, and you're thinking, okay, we're coming here this weekend to redefine some things. You know, if you would ask me what my dreams were when I was 15 years old, and you ask me what my dreams are now, they've definitely been redefined. And that's all because of the gospel. It, and it's also a term, uh, redefine, it's, it's something that we have to humble ourselves to consider. Well, I should probably redefine the direction of my life. And it also implies a recommitment, right? Because as we redefine and we look at what we've defined our, our purpose and existence as, maybe there needs to be a recommitment to God's purpose and design. And our existence needs to be Focus on the gospel. I know that's a word you guys hear a, lot, hear a lot, but I promise you it all comes back to that. Whether you know Jesus, whether you don't know Jesus, everything always comes back to the good news. That should be our focus in life. And now it should not only be our focus in life, but it should be our driving force in life is the good news of Jesus. Now, this water bottle was supposed to be full, but I got thirsty. Um, so just pretend that it's full, right? Look at this, 16.9. Why not 17? Why 16.9? We don't know. And then look, there's too many ingredients. It's just water. Why is it three ingredients? I don't know. But let's just imagine, who here has ever been to the ocean? All right, who's ever been here to the ocean, but the Gulf of Texas doesn't count? I'm sorry, I know. Like half the hands are down. All right, so let's just say... I told you guys, and maybe it really, it's not, right? But what if I just had taken a bottle to the Pacific Ocean? Anyone ever been to the Pacific Ocean? See a couple hands go up, not a lot though. Y'all come with me, okay? We'll all go together. And I took the Pacific Ocean and I put it in this bottle, come back to Children's Texas, and I tell you guys, if you want to experience the Pacific Ocean, here it is. Is it the same? Is, there, is it impossible to really fit the Pacific Ocean into 16.9 fluid ounces? Yeah. Now what's bigger, God or the Pacific Ocean? God, right? He's infinite. It's a humbling thing to, to come before students and teenagers, and I know that you have so much stuff pulling your way, and sometimes I feel the pressure to try to take the Pacific Ocean and fit it into a nice little bottle for you in the next three days that you can just walk around and pull and say, yes, this is it, I have it. But I know God and the fullness of God and the goodness of God and the glory of God, it can't be contained over these next couple of days we have together. But I'm still going to try. But I encourage you that that is one of the most exciting parts about following Jesus is you're always wanting to know more. You're always wanting to, to find out more about who he is and why he put you here. And you never get to the end of it. Even in eternity. We will spend eternity pouring our hearts out to God in devotion and never fully grasping his love and his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. God, I pray for just clarity of thought as we, as we start going through such a, a serious subject, as we look to just humble ourselves together as a community and say, let's redefine our existence, who you are, why we are here. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, so I promise y'all it's not the same sermon, but if you have your Bible or, or, or your phone, go to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and then I can just give a dad joke while you're on your way about the church with three bathrooms, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. Okay, we'll try again later. John. But no, we're not going to be in the epistles, the letters of John, we'll be in the Gospel of John. Look, just because we can't know him fully, remember Pacific Ocean, bottle of water, just because you can't know God fully does not mean that you can't know him truly. Everyone say truly. Truly, you can know God truly. He's, this is the most rapper thing to preach and put your Bible on a symbol for, it's just a moment for me, you know, that this, this music stand wasn't like strong enough to hold my Bible, so I put it on the subwoofer. That's pretty cool. Um, God has revealed enough of himself in this book that you can, I promise you, you can know him truly. Although you may, although you will never know him fully because he's God uh, and we aren't. So existence, it speaks to an objective reality that yes, we're really here, right? Not that I would ever do this, but if I slap you in the face, you're going to feel it. Okay, we're existing in the same time, in the same space. We have life. We have being. So now we have to ask that bigger question, which is why am I here? And the fact that most of us have that burden and that, that, that uh, desire within us to, to figure out why am I here, I think that speaks to the fact that we were created very personal and purposeful that we were made and that we do have a desire to know why we're here. But who or what defines your objective reality? Because remember, if you're off by three degrees, you can end up in a place you, you, you weren't planning to be at. When you think about your reality and your existence in life, is it defined by a process or a person? Is it defined by a process or a person? You know, an evolutionary worldview, in and of itself, it does not give you a purpose. It gives you a process of how they think you're here, but it doesn't establish worth. It doesn't establish a moral code. But you see, a biblical worldview, to see the world through the scripture, it doesn't point you to a process. No, it, it, it supersedes that. It points you to a person, and his name is... No, you, you can say it. I heard you whisper it. No, you got it right. His name is Jesus. Yeah. No, that's right. One more time. I'm going to tell you the answer. And when you say Jesus, his name is Jesus. Jesus. He is the person that gives us our existence. So, I mean, is it, and you can start to contrast, like, when I look at my, per, my, 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 uh, my reality, is it in a process that I had nothing to do with, it was random, or is it with a person? Is it random selection or was there divine intervention? I look at my life and I see divine intervention. It's just undeniable. I look at other people's life. I've seen divine intervention. There was nothing random about it. And also, are we here? Is our reality to simply live to die? Or can we actually flip that and say that we know that we truly live once we die to self, that we actually die to self in the sense so that we can truly, truly live. We can go to the next slide. So here we are. I know we spent a lot of time in the Gospel of John, in these very verses at camp this summer. And I know, though, I also know that you're teenagers and you've slept a lot since then. And actually, I could probably preach the exact same sermons and you probably wouldn't notice. Unless maybe some of you took notes. I know I'm really big on taking notes. But I go to John because John starts off really similar to the book of Genesis. And it is a, a book of beginnings. It tells us something about Jesus. And so if you have your Bible or you have your phone, just open to John chapter 1. Say amen when you get there. Amen when you get there. Is everyone there? All right, let's read the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He, so speaking of Jesus... He was in the beginning with God. All things, how many things? All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. So here's what we know right now. As we look at our existence, our reality, I'm telling you, this, this is reality, this is truth. 
Jesus is the creator. Jesus isn't God Jr. Uh, Jesus isn't the, like, the very, like, um, is it, doesn't come second to, to, to God. Jesus is God in a human body. He is the creator of the universe. And because of that, the creator, listen to me, the creator determines who exists and why they exist. I can't come up with that in and of, in and of myself. I have to find out what does the creator Jesus say that I'm here for. And I, I have a, a funny story that now that my oldest son is out of the house, you know, I was a teenage dad, so it's like it all happened so quick that I already have a kid who's who's an adult and moved out. And now that he's moved out, I have permission to tell the story. Because he should have consulted the creator about something before he made the decision. Um, we used to live out in the country in Oklahoma on, on five acres. And, you know, you don't have, uh, and I feel like we got some good country folk here too, so you'll be able to like understand this. You don't have like the sewage and things like that. They just have a big old septic tank that they bury in your backyard, and you know, that's where things literally go down. After it goes down, that's where they go down. And in, in certain situations, you have like an aerobic system where eventually it goes from one tank through a filtration process, and then it comes out the sprinklers. But this ain't like summertime fun sprinklers. They, you know, you don't plant a garden there, because where's this water really coming from? It's coming from when you flush the toilet. Yes, Sammy. God? Yeah, amen. Yeah, technically, yeah, maybe. So, to my, so the sprinklers are on, and I'll be honest, like, I kind of, like, fallen a little behind, like, you're supposed to, like, pour a bottle of bleach in there every so often. I've fallen a little behind on that, and I'm at the kitchen sink, and I look out the window to my horror. I see my son, he was in third grade at the time, with his childhood friend, mouth gaped wide open, without a care in the world, just running through the sprinklers. I mean, it was like the most dramatic action movie. Like, I'm running, I'm opening the door, like, no, come back. And they're just, what, they can't hear me. They're laughing and playing. And I'm like, no, like, get in. I'm like getting the water hose out and rinsing them off. And I'm like, if you would have known why that was made and what it was for, you would have not gone out and played in the sprinkler system that comes from our septic tank. If he would have only known that it had a different purpose, he thought it had a purpose, like, well, this is good, this is water, I should play in it. No, 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 this is a very, like, this has a very specific purpose, and we use it according to its purpose, and that is that. Jesus is the creator, he has established your purpose. God, let this, let this uh, encourage you. In the beginning was God, but God didn't, didn't need you. God didn't need you. Let's go to the next, the next slide. So when you think about um, why was I made, I just want to be clear that God, everything was, was very um, pleasant and perfect. God was fulfilled, of course, within himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, God wasn't lonely. God made you and, and created you to love you for his glory and for your good. You were made to experience the love of God, to love others, right? So this, Jesus talked about the greatest commandment is to love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. You were made to love and to be loved by God. But sin obviously has broken that and separated it. But in the beginning, before sin came into the world, there was this harmonious relationship between God and man and woman. There was love. They loved, uh, he loved them. They loved him back. When you think about our purpose, know that um, we were designed to worship. We were designed to worship. Our hearts, our hearts are naturally inclined to idolatry. Now look, we may not like go carve a false god out of wood and like bow down to it. But our hearts are drawn to find our identity, to find our passion, our purpose, our pleasure in something other than God. You know, um, the song when you sing, Christ be magnified, you know, says, you know, I won't bow down to idols. Um, and if they put me in the fire, you know, I'll rejoice because you're with me there too. And I think about how sobering it is to see, sing that. And you almost feel like 
I won't buy down the idols, and then you just think about the last like few days of your life, where in little moments maybe you did, you did find your purpose and pleasure and give in, you know, to something other than God. But I want to encourage you that if you could just reorient, right, or redefine or redirect your heart, you can put it on the object that you were made to worship. Because you were made to worship, to celebrate, to love Jesus. We're designed, we're created with a need, and God is the one who fulfills that need. And our life becomes frustrated, and we need to redefine it whenever we try to meet that need with other things. So as we think about Jesus, he was in the beginning. He was the word of God. Jesus is the message from God to the world. He's the expressed thought of God. Jesus made everything. Jesus was the creating agent of God the Father. And Jesus, think about this, he chose to use something as personal as his words to create you, to create the world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we know as we compare that to Genesis that God spoke, He said, let there be light, and there was light. Something so personal that Jesus used His very own Word. Your Word means a lot. How frustrated have you been when someone have twisted your words and used them against you? Because you think, man, I have such an attachment to my words. They're very much a representation of me. Exactly. You were created by the words of God and you were meant to be a representation of him to the world. I think I have a Psalm 33, verse 6 on this next slide. It's just a beautiful a passage of scripture. It says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Colossians 1.16, let's just, let's just repeat the same thing again, that, that Jesus made everything. Listen to Colossians 1.16. For by him, speaking of Jesus, how many things? All things, this is Colossians 1.16. All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created, listen, through him and for him. You were made through Jesus, you were made for Jesus. That is why you exist, is for Jesus. You have many gifts, you have many unique abilities. Why? Why are, you, why are you the way you are? Well, maybe you should think outside of yourself and think about how can I use my unique traits and talents as a way to make much of Jesus and to serve others? It's, I don't want to say it's that simple because that sounds cheap and, and it's actually really hard to live that out on a day-to-day -day basis, but that's what it comes down to. You, whatever you have, it, it's, it's not for yourself, it's for the glory of God, and, it's, and, and the reason is to serve others. Everything was made for Jesus. Whatever gift you have, whatever um, privileges you have, you know, that could be financially or talent, or maybe you're, you're really smart, how do you use that? How do you wield that to make much of Jesus? You know, I think about my life and my relationship with, with music, you know, before God saved me. It's like all I wanted to do with, with my music was make much of myself. I just wanted to look better than I was. I wanted to be present myself as bigger and better than I really was. And when I encountered the love of God in September of 2004, um, I never felt so small in my life. But you know what? I never felt so loved in my life. I never felt so grounded and secure in my life, even though I felt small. You know, we're like this, right? I said that we're wired to worship. We kind of, everyone has a bent towards wanting to celebrate things that we see as great. And it's interesting that when you encounter something that's so big and so breathtaking, you feel so happy and fulfilled, even though you feel so unaware of yourself and so small. It's like when I've seen the beauty of God's creation in certain places that I've been to, it's like the last thing on my mind is like taking picture of me. It's like, no, like, I want to take the picture of that. Because even creation was made through Jesus and for Jesus. And I can even look at creation and use it as something to not worship creation, but worship the creator. As you try to make, use your, you 
you exist to make much of yourself, you'll be very unfulfilled. You may feel big, you may feel larger than life, but you won't feel secure. You won't feel anchored the way you do when you humble yourself under the love of God and say, whatever I have, whatever I can use, Jesus, it's for you. Amen? Now, um, this is where I'm, I'm going to try not to lose you. Because I said God makes us all unique and in different ways. And, and I'll, i got to tell you, I, I am a chronic overthinker. Is anyone else an overthinker? And you, know, you just think and you rethink and keep doing it. And, and sometimes that's good because I can maybe with some of you other overthinkers, we can relate with each other, right? And some people are very much blessed because... They, don't, you know, they just need the simple little thing. You just tell them, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And they will live a faithful Christian witness for the next seven years of their life. Because like, you know what, that settles it for me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But being like, yeah, I know the Bible. And what, what word are we talking about when we say love? And it goes deeper and deeper. And now, tonight, I'm about to give you what I call a sermon within a sermon. This is like inception right now. And if it begins to lose you, then please just find me in the hallway and just say, give it to me in like one minute or less, and I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. But as we think about existence, I really want to dive all the way into the person and the work of Jesus Christ, because that's the foundation. That's the framework. If we're going to build this, this house, build this life, we have to make sure that the foundation is secure. And so now we're going to go in a little bit deeper to who Jesus is. And I hope, and like I said, remember, Pacific Ocean, 16.9 fluid ounce bottle. It's not going to happen, but we hope it's overflowing uh, after the next 15 minutes. So we've established through a few verses that Jesus is our creator. I want to say creator. 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 And Jesus... You know, living in the South in the Bible Belt, which is for some reason I really enjoy that. And I think about going to Japan where it's less than 1% Christian. I think about, man, how hard it is going to be to communicate and draw reference when the name Jesus, they don't quite have the association that we would have with him. But on the, on the downside, also, Jesus is so common. It's kind of like, well, yeah, that's what comes like before guns and sweet tea is Jesus, you know. And sometimes we lose in, in the name Jesus, and we don't even have to get into like translations of what was it really, you know, in the Hebrew. And we might even know this. Y'all guys can finish this statement. Jesus is my Lord and He's my Lord and Savior, right? But do we ever, you know, again, the overthinkers, do we ever slow down and think, well, what do I really mean by that? Because it's one thing for Jesus to be my creator, it's one thing for Him to be my Lord and Savior, but that understates. That falls short of what Jesus truly does. And so I want us to think beyond terms of just him being our creator and even him being our Lord and Savior. And I want you uh, to say this with me. I want you guys to see Jesus as our prophet. Say with me. Prophet, priest, king. Say with me. He is our prophet, priest, king. Amen. Just give it up for that. Y'all not excited yet, but y'all about to be excited. Because that is such good news. So let's go to this next slide. I'm going to try to move fast. I know we got started maybe a little late and you might be tired. But here's the good news. Jesus is our prophet. Jesus is our prophet. He is the bridge from God to man. He's the bridge from God to man. Hebrews 1-2 says, In these last days, everyone say last days. He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. We read about that in John 1, that he created the world. Jesus is the prophet in these last days. Now, I don't mean that like uh, in some, you know, weird, uh, what was the movies left behind? You know, I'm not trying to make y'all think that you're going to get raptured right now. But I just want to say that and there's many opinions from all of our brothers and sisters in Jesus about the, about the last days. But maybe we can disagree with this simple definition. The last days point us to the fact that the Messiah has come. He's lived the life we couldn't live. He's died a death we deserve. He's resurrected. He's appeared to witnesses. He's ascended into heaven. He sent his Holy Spirit to empower the church. That happened a long time ago, but guess what? Since that happened, we've been living in the last days. We've been living in the last days. 
Now, for over 1,800 years, that's a long, long time. 1,800 years. It's hard to even wrap our mind around that. God had spoke to man and woman in many different ways. Think about it. You can go through your Bible and you say, okay, he was in the uh, burning bush with Moses and he spoke to him. He, um, he, he was with Abraham and Isaac. Is that ram in the bush when he provided an offering and a sacrifice so that Isaac wasn't. He spoke in visions like that Isaiah had, this prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, he had this vision in the temple. He spoke through parables, through prophecy. He spoke through poetry. That's what the book of, you know, Psalms and, and, and things like that. That is poetry. He spoke through angels. He spoke through natural events, through supernatural events. But now, listen, but now, that was for 1,800 years, but now God has spoken louder, bolder, and more clearly than ever before, and he spoke through his son, Jesus. You see, the common thread of God's message is in the Old Testament you had prophets. And the way the prophet would operate was he was to be um, the message of God given to man. And the way the Old Testament priest would operate is he was more so the message of man given back to God. Or you could say this, the prophet was a bridge from God to man, thus saith the Lord. And the priest acted as a bridge from man to God, offering sacrifices for the sins of the people. Lord, forgive us. Lord, receive us. Are you all with me? Maybe. I know. It's getting deep. Remember, just uh, message me after this and say, hey, give me like the kids church version. You know what I mean? Okay, so this common thread throughout the Bible is you have these messengers from God who point out man's problem, sin, and God's solution. And guess what? Jesus is the solution. So to Adam, God prophesied himself, and he told Adam and Eve that the Messiah should come from the seed of woman. To Abraham, he said, hey, he's going to spring from your loins. If we're going to talk about King James style, you know what I mean? Let's do it. Let's go all the way there. To Jacob, that the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. To David, you remember King David? Boom, giant, slingshot. I remember that, right? That's a good story. To King David, he said, guess what? He's going to be of your household. To Micah, he said he was going to be born in Bethlehem. He was. To Isaiah, he said the Messiah will be born of a virgin. He was. And using the science of probability, a, a mathematician and someone with way, way smarter than me determined that the chances of fulfilling all of these prophecies, I just named a few, and the ramification is to be one in 100 Quadrillion. That's a big number. I think that's about the, how much the U.S. is in debt right now. I don't know. One in 100 quadrillion. These are prophecies. But guess what? Jesus is the final prophet. It gets no better than Jesus. Jesus is a bridge from God to man. He's a message from God spoken perfectly and truly to man. But guys, I want to say it gets better. It really does get better because not only is our prophet... Jesus is our priest. Everyone say priest. Jesus is our priest. You see, and no one ever did this before. If you look in your Bible, in the Old Testament, there was always a prophet here, a priest here, a king here. But it was never all in one person. But see, Jesus fulfills all three offices of prophet, priest, and king. And if you really think about Jesus as your priest and you belong to Jesus, it will so comfort your heart and your Existence. Hebrews 7.25, I have it up there. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives to make intercession. intercession. You know, Romans 8.34 says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who has raised more than that, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. If you belong to Jesus, there's not a moment, there's not a moment that he is not interceding for you as your high priest. Now think about the Old Testament. You can read about the job of the high priest. It was a scary job. Basically, it's like being a butcher, for one. Lots of blood, lots of animals. And you know, my daughter's a vegetarian, so I'm treading carefully. She used to eat bacon, but I don't know what happened. Y'all pray for us. Um, 
They would have to offer sacrifices for their own sin before they can start offering sacrifices for the sins of Israel. Does Jesus have any sin? Does Jesus have any sin? No. So he never has to offer sacrifice for his own sin. That's why Jesus is better. Jesus is a better prophet. Jesus is a better high priest. The Old Testament priests were limited because they would have to make their sacrifices over and over and then they would die. But Jesus lives forever. He intercedes for us and he offered himself as a sacrifice once and for all. Wait, wait, wait. Let's back up. Jesus is God. Jesus existed in the beginning. He created the world. Jesus establishes a system that's to be a shadow of something he himself would fulfill. Jesus takes on the title the Lamb of God and he knows exactly what happens to the Lamb. He knows exactly what happens to the Lamb. He knows that when he comes, he's not going to find a lamb or a literal scapegoat and prepare it. He knows that he is the lamb. He is the scapegoat. He would be the offering. That is the love of God. The Old Testament priest could offer a sacrifice, but they could never be one. And why would Jesus advocate for such sinful, ungrateful, jacked up people like us? Because Jesus loves us. He loves you. He loves you. He can't possibly love you any more than he loves you right now. And you know, sometimes we are so defensive, and I think if we really look at the root of us being so defensive, it's because we want to advocate for ourselves instead of just surrendering and trusting that Jesus advocates for us. He is your defender. He will be a better defender of you than you could ever be for yourself. Jesus is your victory. Jesus is your redeemer. When we really come to grips that the king of kings, the God who created the universe is our advocate, we don't have, we can rest our case. We don't have to argue with people and defend ourselves. It's like, hey, you know what? I sinned, I messed up, I own it, but Jesus is my advocate. So when we advocate, sometimes we'll downplay our sin or we'll maybe exaggerate our victory, right? The fish was this big. We might manipulate. We might gaslight uh, in our self-advocacy. But Jesus, we can try to advocate and defend ourselves, but it's all fluff. That's what I'm saying. It's all fluff. But Jesus just points to the holes in his wrist and feet. And there is substance to that. There is truth to that. So think about this. Jesus being your high priest, we read that he intercedes for us. And he always lives to make intercession. That when you fall into sin in an ugly way, this is for my people here who have trusted in Jesus. When you fall in an ugly way, when you really mess up and you may think, I can't talk to Jesus the prophet, I can't talk to Jesus the king, I can't. No, no, yes you can because he's not just prophet. He's not just king, he's your priest. And Jesus does not hesitate to step in and cover you with his righteousness. That when you stand before God in heaven, he sees the goodness of Jesus covered over you. And just, just imagine that. When you fall into sin, when you think, oh man, like I, I really need to redefine my purpose. If you belong to Jesus, he covers you. He intercedes for you. He's your high priest. There's no room for punishment. Jesus took all the punishment in our place. Amen. And then at last, but definitely not least, Jesus is king. If I can have the band come back up as I make uh, this last point. Jesus is prophet. Jesus is priest. Amen. Jesus is king. But he just has the right and authority to, to do these things, to be the message of God, to be that bridge from God to man, to be the priest, to be that, that bridge to get man back to God. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, it's a very familiar verse, says, therefore, speaking to the, the humility of Jesus' death and his obedience, that Jesus was obedient 
is the Son of God. He submitted and was obedient to the Father. So God has highly exalted him and given, bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, at the name of every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. So King Jesus was appointed by God, not man. See, Israel wanted a king. They wanted to be like all the other nations, so they wanted a king. So, they, so, so hey, you know what? I'm, don't, I'm a rapper. I'll, I'll go into a whole song about it. You got the right person here if you want to do that. We can take it there. I'll be tomorrow night. He is appointed by God, not man. He's not man's king in the sense that man chose him. No, God appointed him. King Jesus provides our every need. King Jesus protects us. You know, you look at the job of a king. He was to protect the people, to provide for the people. This is what Jesus does for us. And you look at this contrast as a, a, a King David, such a shadow of what King Jesus would be fully and completely. David was promised that his descendants would have a kingdom and a throne forever. 2 Samuel 7, 12-13, it says, Hey, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up an offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. That's Jesus. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You know, David would have sailed and, and, and overcome um, what used to be enemy land, David would go with the armies of Israel. He would conquer that and they would dwell in what was once enemy land. But Jesus does even better. Jesus defeats the darkness and dwells in our heart, which used to be an enemy territory. Jesus overcame the unbelief and the sin in the human heart to be our king. David overcame Goliath. Jesus being king means I don't have to worry. It's hard to trust Jesus as king and worry at the same time. And, and I do. I, I struggle with worry. It's, it's life, right? But sometimes you just have to slow down and tell yourself Jesus is king. He provides. He protects. I want to close with this beautiful quote from Charles Spurgeon. And remember, uh, you know, if you just off three degrees, it can make a big difference. So maybe this weekend isn't going to be any, any big thing that happens, but maybe it's just that one step back in the right direction, that if you continue to walk in that, 30 years from now, you'll be where you need to be. Listen to this quote from Charles Spurgeon. Oh, there is in contemplating Christ a balm for every wound in meditating on the Father, there is quiet for every grief. And in the influence of the Holy Spirit, there is soothing for every soul. So our, our time of response tonight, I just want it to be a time of reflection and to truly worship with unguarded hearts. Just to be brave enough to let the guard down and worship Him. Maybe in the first time, you're going to worship Him as your prophet, as your priest, as your king. Because we exist we exist. I could have just said this and walked off. I'll finally tell you what the sermon's about. We exist to make much of Jesus and to invite others to do the same. So let's stand to our feet as we get ready to worship. Lord, we thank you. You are the picture of you, God, and your word as prophet, priest, and king is all the comfort we need. No matter the troubles we're going through tonight, no matter the adversities we face, the relationships that are broken, you are the bridge from God to man. You are the bridge from man back to God. You are the king who provides and protects. You are the prophet who reveals God to us perfectly. You are the priest who never goes away, who always lives to cover us in our sin. We love you, Jesus. Amen.